from the known to the unknown in search of enlightenment, knowledge, and truth. Good evening, good afternoon on uh, Wolf Spirit Radio and Revolution Radio, 115% homegrown organic Revolution Radio. We uh, are, that's right, we're 115% listener supported. Um, like, we need more. Uh, we, need an ex- we need that extra 15% uh, just, to, uh, just to keep going through the month. Um, and uh, so if you could... Uh, kindly drop some coins in the support in fact if you drop some coins we'll send you a coin if you're in the states um and you uh you give us 50 bucks we'll give you a silver dollar you know we'll give you an ounce of silver it's a bar but it's a yeah that's a dollar a dollar is an ounce that's what it is it's a measurement anyhow anyhow so it's very lovely to have you all here um and tonight i have a very special friend that i'd like to bring in just right now and until she is connected here, let's just cover the time. And uh, the the guest I have tonight um, is a fellow Wall Spirit Radio host, and uh, uh, we've been running a Thursday morning or Thursday afternoon, depending on where you are, or Thursday evening in the. Uh, in the UK, um, but depending on where you are, we we've, we've been running uh, this show on Thursdays, and um, yeah, about hmm, twenty weeks ago, she came up to me and, and said, uh, "I've got this thing, uh, th- I've got this message," and uh, uh, he seems to be some kind of um, some sort of person from some far far galaxy, um, and. Uh, it's uh he's like in a prison planet and you know he's got a tattoo of a barcode on the back of his head and he's known by a number and uh and uh and he's sitting in a cell and he's got a shaved head and he's like pale and pale blue and you know it's like a, a very you know very alien dystopian society kind of image of their they were as a society um completely under the control of reptilian overlords who were known as the Vincala who appeared to be quite innocent at first and then they uh, they took over these people from within and uh, and so we meet this person who was uh, known as a number um, and he gave himself a name so before I name this person I'm going to name my guest who is my dear friend Jessica Morocco good afternoon how are you Jess hello JP how are you I am very well oh uh, could you move the mic just a little bit away from your mouth okay yeah is that better that's lovely yeah that's lovely you okay, just, good. just a little overdriven um, so uh, yes and um, so How's that for a synopsis of like where it started? Or I mean, how how was it for you? And um, yeah, of course, would you like to introduce yourself <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to the uh, the Monday night audience, which is Revolution Radio, uh, FreedomSlips dot com, Studio B, and uh, as I said, we're a listener supported station, so uh, go to the support area and uh, drop some coins in the PayPal. Um, but uh, we are. Um, We've been uh, doing this thing, and how, how did it? How did it start? How, you know, want to tell people about it because it, it's really it, it's become a lot more than it appeared. To, sorry, a lot more than it appeared to be at the beginning, didn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, I probably started when I was a child. I mean, I've been open up psychically from from a very early age, and had uh, experiences where you know I I wrote about in my book, The Sea or Violets in the Grass, um, where I. Re- recall a spacecraft hovering over my house and finding myself outside in the middle of the, the night wondering why I was out there by myself I was probably about four years old or so and having a very distinct clear vision of it remembering it and uh, also this really distorted um, fish-eyed lens type of um, atmosphere where everything had this distortion 
and my home looked like it was on the top of the world. It was very strange. Uh, and I never forgot that, that imagery, but um, we're not here to really talk about my book in particular, but I think it, it was probably because I was so open and um, open psychically and uh, also having um, a very unusual experience where I opened up to the Akashic Records before I recognized what they were at, at probably around the age of 30, um, having a full movie screen going on in, in my inner seeing. And um, so having these type of things, you know, just I think my being open allowed me to be able to re receive these types of transmissions. So as I would, I started, um, I got certified in hypnosis and past life regressions because um, I found them very helpful for me personally. And there's a lot of people that are opening up now and becoming more aware and remembering who they are and who they were and which is all one and the same it's just remembering their soul experience and as I started to see how this stuff happened I thought well let me you know keep helping people out and as I help people out sometimes I kind of enter into these spaces where they're going to and so that sort of happened where I was doing a uh, hypnosis session with someone it, with an intent to do a past life regression and it could have been a past life regression we weren't quite sure what it was where um, she opened up to something and um, but then didn't want to talk about it afterwards um, uh, however I uh, ended up getting a new friend which was um, this being called Andronicus and I saw him seated as you described in a very um, almost like a cell a small area um, like a prison cell it looked like it was um, like cement um, but maybe painted white or, or in a white tone. Um, that was the wall was, walls were white, the ceiling was white, the floor was white, and he was wearing what looked like almost like a karate outfit, for a lack of better terms, you know, kind of a, a jacket that was crisscrossed. And, um, he was seated, he was bald, um, could have been perceived as a monk, you know, in, in, in some, maybe uh, in the human society. Um, but he uh, definitely looked different. Uh, his skin was uh, much whiter than our skin tone is. Even, you know, some people that with a lighter skin tone, he was, you know, even whiter. And uh, his eyes were um, dark. And uh, he uh, had a very round face, round head, and had these numbers floating around him. And some of them were on his... Uh, Head and then I saw a barcode or a, like a number signature and I recognized that he was from a slave society and we had a discussion and he told me he was, he had this incredible, um, ability for telepathy to the point where he was not only communicating in this expansion of time space, um, throughout, you know, the universe but also um, the, what I'm finding is, is there's, he's kind of, we're essentially way in the future from when this has happened. So, uh, and, and it was confusing. We were trying, I was trying to understand the timelines when he was describing what was going on. And what he ultimately said to me was, is, you know, that, that he, they were in prison. They knew that they were stuck here, but it was almost like communicating with us. He started to look into our field of experience and it sort of awakened him. And he realized how to get out of the situation, awaken the others, then they get free of this, this slave experience and free of these beings, which were reptilian of nature. Um, and then, uh, even a, having the ability to turn their society back to their original form in, in a form of time travel or reset, what he called it is like a reset, maybe not a button, but of some sort that enabled them to take their planet and reset it and bring it back to its original form uh, and said he was from Andromeda he said that very specifically so I'm hearing from him I'm like alright I'm not going to think about it I'm not going to process it psychologically I'm just going to um, write down what he's saying see if there's any coherency to this see if this you know after a while it will fizzle out and I, that's what I thought that, you know, yeah, you know, because you get these different ones that have come in and out and have spoken to me. Sometimes I speak to them once, sometimes it's multiple times. 
some some of them have been with me all along some of them you know it's just been a seasonal thing or when I'm dealing with specific people certain um, beings arrive I'll say it like like that but with Andronicus um, it's been very intense uh, every week I kind of sense him around and uh, I do I always say that, you know, I talk to him on Tuesday, so <laughs> I don't know, it's like a scheduled thing, <laughs> but sometimes it's our Monday, or, you know, I mean, it's just like right around that time. And, uh, you know, and I'm able to ask him questions, and so these are questions that I'm, I'm curious about, and then before you know it, it's, it's expanding into this, this incredible wisdom, and, um, you know, like, today I was talking to him about Source, and, and the information that came through was just, really phenomenal and it wasn't anything that I had ever known so um, what I said to JP <laughs> right I said I don't know what this is maybe we can kind of do a run through and I thought he had the perfect voice for Andronicus now I don't really know the tone of Andronicus's voice I don't hear him that way I kind of hear and know what he's saying but there is that calm Wisdom that he has that I thought JP would have the perfect, um, calm wisdom that suited the, the character of Andronicus. And, uh, so, you know, JP, you, you started to read through with me and then I contacted you again and I said, I have another one. And then I contacted you again. I said, it's still going. And I think we even at one point found that there, he said some some kind of um, metal material was on the planet called Crintinium. And maybe that's, you know, it was just like all this like really unusual stuff. And what was really f- interesting is that I think, um, and, and this is my, my perspective, is JP, is it seems like it stimulated some of your thoughts. And then when we would do the show for two hours, and before you know it, it would spin off into other conversations that maybe needed to be um, unfolding live on air. And as we did that, other topics would come up, and I I felt like it, it was cathartic in some ways, spiritually cathartic. I felt like it was it covered a lot of different areas that we hadn't thought about but maybe what were necessary. And even then you started talking about some of the inventions that, that started to come up around that time. And I don't know if there was a parallel or, um, you know, inspiration from all of this that created that. I don't know, but it did seem to um, happen around the same time. So, um, yes, I don't know. I mean, tell me what you think. Well, there was, there was I mean, it, there's so much cross-pollination, we can call it, um, yes. in... The, well, it's been, I, the way it's been almost for me is like a weekly episode of like a kind of real life interactive Star Trek audio mm-hmm. thing. And, you know, you come up and it comes out about four pages, which is like a chapter. Yes. And it's like a chapter of a story that is interacting in some bizarre way with our own world um, things that he talks about occur in our world the names are different the energy is mm-hmm. the same you know and now he started talking about our planet and as and his interaction with people from our planet uh, and time travel and as you said the holographic reset of an entire planet Mm-hmm. So you understand what that means, people. It's like, yeah, they may frack the hell out of the world, but we can reverse it. Because I don't know if anybody's aware of uh, Alex Collier has been talking about the Andromedans have this machine. It's like a holographic <laughs> camera. And it takes a photo of you, and then you can wind it back through the years till you were healthy again. And then they apply that hologram to you, and you're reset. And so... And see, I didn't that's know anything that about on a, Alex, that's, Alex Collier's work. Yeah, that's that on a, on a, uh, you know, a larger scale, but that's the same principle. And, you know, as of course, it's, you know, it's a holographic omniverse. 
then uh, you know that's that's the way it's going to work. So it's a, it's a fascinating thing, you know, that even though we may think that we're on the brink of breaking the planet, um, there is a way that you know what they call them um a third level no what is it a third level society oh god i can't remember there's a particular uh coding of uh of uh, levels of society that you know some you know some some people can you know uh, terraform uh you know a country some can terraform a planet some can terraform a solar system you know okay. type 3 civilization that's what they're talking about uh, type three civilization is somebody that people that can move stars around and can probably do this, uh, um, you know, holographic uh, planetary reset. So that's what they did with their Andromedan planet. They reset the thing till b back before the 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 reptilian overlords came. So mm -hmm. carry on, Jeff. Yeah, and, and they, they have a few different attributes that I thought were interesting. One is they're very mindful of plant life. And I would not be surprised if um, they were influential on the development and growth of the, or their contribution as a society, the development and growth of, you know, our agricultural knowledge. Uh, they, um, there, there are many species that they discuss. And uh, interact with, and each one you know contributes something. But um, it's it's kind of a, a little humorous at times in how that Andronicus gets annoyed because of some of their differences and and behaviors. Um, hey, Jess. <laughs> yeah. You just named him. We've forgotten to name him. Who? The Andronicus. Yeah, no, I I said it was Andronicus earlier. Did you? No. All right, all right. Because so, because you know, I I I've forgotten to introduce him, and and that's the thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, his yes. name his name is Andronicus. He's 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 called himself, and it's like he's it's almost like he's declaring himself as the galactic human. You know? He is. He calls himself. He said that his uh, his culture is like our cousins. That they're. And also, they seem to be our caretakers in some way, watching over us. And, um, you know, like I, I think early on, if you listen to the earlier transmissions, the um, Andromedan Strain, which is a movie, there were quite a few movies that had this type of society. And he, it was their impression that they were sending to us telepathically, not so much that that was our future, but that their, that was their past or that was their experience at the time that it was being sent to us. So by the time we received the information, it already had passed and gone. But they were, we were thinking that this is our future and it's not necessarily so. And I think that was important for him to share that with us is to not be dreadful about what's, what's ahead of us, but to be more hopeful. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of things that he says that are very, um, I find very encouraging. And also to, to show that, you know, the, the struggles that he had is the same type of struggles that we have. And, you know, as we have different cultures and different families that developed into, uh, states and nations and, and borders, um, he had to deal with these different species. Uh, he has, he was, part of his work was to go to these outposts. And when they went to the outposts, these other species were either there or some would arrive afterwards. And, uh, one of them being is the Vincala, he calls them the Vincala, which are the, um, reptilian race and the, uh, the lizard type of race he calls a Sleetaran. And, uh, some people had mentioned that the Slee stack or something from, uh, was another, Show I forget what the Slytherin there. from uh, oh, Harry Potter. Yeah, Harry, yeah, Harry it's Potter. got that. It has this slippery, slithery uh, yeah. sort of sound to it. The Sleetarin, and uh, they're like you know there are many different kinds of reptile, and uh, you know you have crocodiles, and you have um, go out what to call them quails. Um, oh God, I've forgotten the names of them. Geckos and you know all these different chameleons. They're all different mm -hmm. levels of reptile, and they're not all, they're not all like the Komodo dragon, you know, which is no, like they're all, not all evil. Yeah, yeah, they're not all they're testosterone, um, yeah. <laughs> which is basically their problem. 
you know, I was talking about this with with Noreen just now. Uh, you know, it's the centre of the brain that the, they've wiggled their way in, and that can control everybody right from the base centre. So you've got to master the base centre, establish a base. So there, there we are. We've got the uh, we've got the the Vincala, and they're they're kind of on the run now from the Andromedans. Some but they're also like moving ahead, and they get into the human. They go into the future before anyone else does. Ah. Start messing things up. And and of course, what we got to realize is that um, your first meeting and Andronicus from a long, long time ago. I mean, right. it's all like maybe hundreds of thousands of years, maybe even millions of years ago. Because mm -hmm. time is an illusion, folks, as we all keep talking about, um, and it's possible to do this sort of stuff. It's possible to have instant communication anywhere, any when, with anyone. Uh, you just have to believe that you can. <laughs> That's all it takes. You you have to have uh, what uh, was you know uh, a chutzpah, you know that you can do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but you just don't think about it. So sort yeah. of like you know that all right, this is not happening exactly right now. And that, and then you start getting into this space, and you see that time space is, is I don't know, somehow like like a folder system, you know, just like pages, and 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 kind of like the dimensions or whatever. They look like pages to me, and uh, <clears throat> you know, I've seen um, uh, Shiva almost moving in and out of those pages. It's really cool, you know, just kind of he can jump through those dimensions, but he also kind of passes through them just kind of lightly like floats through through each page and uh, and and that's I guess it's some, it might have been symbolic how you was showing me that but um, they're you know the dimensions are like veils you know so so if someone is seeing through they always say that you know the, the mediums they see through the veils well yeah I mean it's almost like you lift the veil and now you're in that space and this space at the same time and uh, but although there is a difference you know because there's a separation but you just can't see it so, uh, time space is in the same way. So you, you're looking through this time space, um, not necessarily like a portal, although you may see a portal. You may see something that has this circular, uh, appearance and it's kind of has, has a distortion illusion, which, um, that circular energy, you know, essence would have. But for the most part, you know, when you're stepping through those, those dimensions, you don't have to go through a portal to see it. Um, but anyhow, so, yes, yeah, so the time-space thing is not, it's not anything that you think about, although you know it at the moment when it is, sort of, maybe not on a calendar, but um, kind of an estimated time, like, you know, pre-human uh, history, or, you know, you kind of have, a, have an, an essence of an idea. And also, by what he is saying, I'm asking him, where are you now, and where are we? You know, and so he's kind of showing me, and then I'm seeing that he, you know, at times he's jumping around. So it's it seems very simple for him to move into this space, whereas we have to see things much more in a linear way, where it starts to make sense. I think that uh, what we're doing is transdimensional, and that what he, you know, he's he's going into a kind of hyperspace uh, place. Where he, you know, you can go anywhere, any when. This is the kind of energy that we've we've been, um, try, you know, what's the word? Uh, trans, not trans. Oh, I've forgotten the word that takes. You know, we've we've been going across this energy line of, um, you know, stepping out of the third dimension into another dimension, then back in, into another, um, um, another place and time. As if it was yeah. just like tuning into an internet website. Well, you know, he even talks about time travel, and um, and that that piece was really interesting to me because you know it's very appealing. People, you know, how many people have fantasized? Well, I'd love to be a time traveler. And um, one thing he he did say is he says uh, the Andromedans can go through time, but they usually go through time as observers, not really as strong participants. And I think that's that's the key. And I said, and then he, um, and I, I, st you know, I, he probably sensed that I was like, wow, that would be really fascinating. And he kind of forewarned me and said, 
if, if and, and the type type of stuff we're talking about is him moving through time and space and being able to see things and is is different from going through um, a time traveling uh, linear t- um, timeline. Um, I'm trying to explain it because it actually is different because those that are traveling through space are not necessarily time traveling, right? You see what I'm saying, JP? Yes. Yes. I mean, okay. it, it's dimensional. I mean, there's so many, there's, there's, there's dimensions that we have in this universe, and then there is different universes. You know, it's like the next, it's like the, the galaxies of galaxies. It's like the next level up. Right. And if we were to get in a spacecraft, we would experience more of what Andromeda is experiencing, or Andronicus is experiencing, of, of where that, you know, the, the, and the other species are when they're traveling to other planets. Um, but, what if we go to the human timelines? Um, that's the time travel that I'm talking about. Is where you're stepping into the, the 1840s or the, uh, you know, the time of Christ or you know something like that. And he forewarned me. He said that wherever you were born in whatever timeline you were born, if you were moving into another um, timeline uh, or um, another place in time. Um, you can't really stay there, he said, because it, he said that there, it's almost like a um, like a Xerox or a, a print of you, and uh, your soul is not fulfilling what it's supposed to do in the in the organic place where you were born. So you throw things off. You're not actually uh, following through it with your soul's purpose. So um, and, and unless we're away from this this human experience and this system. Then maybe it would be different, but even he told me that he does not come into our, um, doesn't time travel and kind of get involved. He said, but others have, the Vincala have, or what the reptilians have, which is why they got into problems and why it interfered and bothered, you know, or, or disrupted some of the human experience. And they're not the only ones that have done this. And every time, that something like this does happen, we have something that's kind of um, greater than what we know how to handle, like some of the, the world wars. You know, I know that the uh, World War II in particular was, uh, there actually needed to be an intervention to prevent um, this overthrow of or this one world order type of thing that was trying to come in. And uh, that was just, that was a species that was trying to dominate. Uh, the entire planet, and so there was that kind of disruption. We can't have this, um, and so it's almost like they're kind of policing in a way, making sure that that the human humans are not uh, overrun in some way by this, you know, full control system. So at least it's nice to know that we have that sort of safeguard, but um, it, it kind of does like play its way out a little bit in some way. Uh, until we start saying, "Hey, we don't want this. We don't want it," <laughs> you know, and then, and then it's like, like you know, the things start to change in another direction because our will is incredibly strong, and um, even even though whatever comes into whatever type of uh, species comes into our our human existence, if our, if our will chooses not to embrace it, we do have. I believe we can overpower it by intention. And because our collect, because we still in, in many ways, um, and, and probably always have, um, a strong force, uh, regarding our intention. And because this is our planet, this was given to us, um, by source. And so I think we do have the strongest persuasion. You know, if that makes any sense. Well, in, in the, if we align ourselves with the planet, then we're mm-hmm. the strongest of all because we're working with the grain. You know, we're, we're yes. working instead of trying to uh, struggle against things, we're cooperating with things, and it's so much easier. It's more fun, and uh, you know you're on the right side. It just is very simple. So It's like eliminating fear. You know? yes. Get, yes. Getting out of the mode of fear. Everyone's afraid of, of the extraterrestrials. Some of them are benevolent. They're really here to help us. Some of them, maybe they're not benevolent, but are, are intriguing. <laughs> Could be, you know, maybe have mislead us. 
but they, they are interesting either way. And, and some of them are just, you know, they're of the contrast, they call it. They're of the contrast. They're, they, they're malevolent in a way. They're here to, you know, create an, uh, con, uh, contrast of experiences because some humans do want to experience some of these contrasts. And that's still here again. It's, it's the human will that, that comes into play and source allows certain things to a certain degree. Um, of course, we're all responsible for ourselves. No one, no one here to blame. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's all very, very interesting. Indeed. And, uh, well, I mean, let's, let's talk about some of the, the creatures that this guy's met. I mean, okay. and first of all, let's, okay. let's talk about the guy himself, right? So, okay. we first meet Andronicus, and he's a prisoner, and he's like, hmm, pretty hopeless at the beginning, but like, realizes that once he makes contact, things rapidly change. It's almost like, you know, he was touched by an angel from his perspective. And that mm-hmm. gave, gave him such strength. So, what, what happens is we see the transformation of this being from some, someone who was very passive at the beginning. And this is the whole thing about them. They, you know, they didn't have very much emotion. Um, and they, you know, they're a bit, uh, yeah, all right, you know, whatever you want. Kind of very, very in service, too yeah. servile for their own good. And what this whole episode has given them, because, of course, this is a hero's journey for Andronicus, um, is his transformation, because he has to then actually deal with... You know, and it's it's like in Star Trek, when uh, he's just, you know, we've just, we've just made friends with the Klingons, and mm-hmm. the Romulans are like, we start to understand them at least, you know, they're still hostile, but we get the idea. Um, and, you know, we, we, we've now got the, you know, the exchange students and stuff like that with the Klingons. Um, and so we have this, uh, he, 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 they get a handle on the Vincala, the, uh, the reptilian force. Um, and are now kind of chasing them <laughs> back, back towards Earth to try and stop them, you know, wreaking havoc elsewhere. Because mm-hmm. I think that they would be really, would they be the tall whites? Uh, they're, they're kind of a tall white reptilian race, aren't they? They seem like regular reptilian, maybe greenish, brownish. Uh, I just had a quick glimpse of them, but I know what you're talking about. But the ones that I saw were might have been gray, green, brown uh, variations. Kind of like a real reptile looking, like a, uh, whether it's a lizard or, you know, ha- having almost those colors in them. Mm-hmm. And is there, are their faces, you know, really out and out snouty or more humanoid? Do they have noses and mouths and things like that? Or, or just kind of, or are they more like the snouty, you know, uh, orange eyes with the slits and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. More like that. And, and their bodies, though, looked more humanoid. So it's almost like their face was uh, reptilian-like. All right, so it's like a reptile head on a humanoid body. That, this is what yeah, we're, we're meeting is, at the moment. Yeah, you know, yeah. The skin is definitely of a different color. You know, it's you know got the the striations and lines and everything that, that the reptiles have, and kind of that rough skin. And that, the uh, thing about these guys, though, Jess, is that they appear to be, you know, <laughs> but. Um, you know, kind of innocent and stuff, but they realize that they have this kind of um, mind control thing going on. Yeah, uh, we attribute it to like the scalar um, technology that's available yes. now. It's a sort of that what they were doing is it was an underlay of, of some kind of a humming tone or something that was sort of getting into, it was like going into the back door. So they were in, they were interacting with the Andromedans, and the Andromedans are essentially passive. And it's not that they were emotionless; it was just that they were almost like innocent. And so they they you know were more cal- like calculating and were uh, not calculating like planning in, in a bad, negative way, but more of um, you know oh that doesn't make any sense; it's not logical. It's sort of like the Spock type of thing from like Star Trek. Yeah. They were just sort of logical and. 
and some of these emotions didn't really have any purpose um, or they hadn't evolved into that and it was more of just kind of interpreting it and you know well you know when you're growing these plants you know it should come up to about this many inches and you know it was more like they were just examining I'd say sort of like scientists in a way so they were sort of passive and just observing everything and listening and so here's the Vincala show show up and they're talking in a normal tone but um, there's this sound you know in the background it's kind of this white noise I was picking up and then, and then and the sound came in. It was and then it was started to um, have subliminal or has said some kind of um, messaging. And then before you know it, the the they were um, through a back door. They became subservient and started following orders. And uh, at one point, you know, um, Andronicus recognizes what's going on. He's, and he tries everything to break free of it and isolates himself and uh, gets deeply into what, you know, would be like this meditative state, which to me almost looked like he was in a peaceful protest. And so um, that's how the Vincala moved. And so then we started examining what's going on on our planet right now and where did this scalar technology and this whole mind control concept come from? Well, it was introduced by the Vincala or the reptilians. They brought this technology with them and it was it was a method in a way to control things because that's what they like to do they control each other and then they they want to control everything else around them so it's part of their their attributes and uh and and just kind of their makeup it's when you think about it a lot of animals like you know even the wolf has is a, is in a pack and they expect this level of obedience so it's kind of if you look at it that way that's that was you know probably what was going on with them uh, genetically, but you know that it got to a bigger problem. <laughs> yeah, well, it 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 turned into a dominant hive mind kind yes. of situation, almost. Um, and what's interesting about the the the, the Vincala is like they seem to be a carrier of this mind virus, much like in Stargate the. The, the beings, the humanoid beings, had this uh, entity inside them that w- that made their eyes glow for a start. You know, they would light up their pineal gland, basically. It would make their, the whites of their eyes glow. And um, it would uh, it would give them super psychic powers. Um, but but it was basically controlling the body from, the, from the, you know, the brain stem. And, well, Dune, and Dune. Dune had the same thing. Yes. Where their eyes would turn blue, you remember? In Dune. Ah, no, that's the spice, and that's the spice did it. Yeah, yes. the same thing. It was like a control. That's Isn't right. It? Now, and, and the, here we're going to go to something that is now on this planet, which is what we call the black goo. Mm-hmm. And this then connects with the black stone, or Schwarzstein, which is the German SS. That's what SS stood for. Schwarzstein, which means black stone, which means black goo. It's the goo, it was the the black stone that they extracted the black goo from, that then infected all the Nazis and gives them that mind control, hive mind, Nazi kind of thing. So that? that then that brings us to the other species that Andronicus deals with. So he first deals with what he called the Vincala, and I had to figure it out that they were the reptilians, because I figured it out because that's what they look like. And then this other species shows up after um, they, uh, well, we'll get back to the, there, there's a path that they go through that introduces them to these species. And one was a sector, after they leave Andromeda, they go to sector 438, and I'm not sure where that is. Um, but there they find um, uh, the, the Mars beings are there. But then there's the other being that they find on um the, the blue blue planet Zephron they called it, and those were the the um, Ketrons. And what I found out afterwards is the Ketrons or were the Titans, and they also had um, sort of a controlling way about them, but it was different from the the uh, Vincala. Um, I'm trying to. Well, when when we first met the the, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to pronounce it slightly different, as I as I've been talking about because I think it's there's something connected here, uh, with the Catrons. 
right? Uh, mm-hmm. Because we we come across these uh, ketrons and and they're uh, they're like a um, he says they're like an, a larger cousin of the vincala, but they're not the same. They don't. They look very human. Yeah. So they, those are the large whites, maybe that that you were looking for, are the titans. Yeah. So the tall whites or the titans, and the names that are starting to appear are starting to sound very familiar as what we call the titans of old, right? So we could say that you know, yes, that uh, Andronicus is is talking to us from a period that we know beyond our classical period and uh, back to the time when the stories that arose in the classical period actually happened like the story of Gilgamesh and and uh, all of these things and so uh, Andronicus is starting to meet these people right and it's it's fascinating I mean uh, how fascinating is it Spock? Fascinating oh Come on, say it again. Fascinating. Yeah, that's how spa- that's how fascinating it is. <laughs> because, because he starts talking about various names, and right. these uh, these are these are names that start to sound familiar. And there was one, um, and this is before we met the Catronians, I think, or the Catrons, that uh, we met. Uh, a female and they called her a queen because I believe that the reptilians call all females queens mm. in the same way that we call a female cat a queen and we call a female dog a bitch okay. that you would call a human female a queen you see mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know or they you know you call a, a, a bovine female you call that a cow and you call a bovine male a bull you know, it's just a name, you know, mm-hmm. um, not a rank. I'm not sure, but who knows, because it might come back that way. But do you want to talk about the human female and what her journey was? Because it's it was pretty terrifying. Well, what ha- um, the journey went from Andromeda, you know, in this really state of, Catastrophe. It looked like the the planet was burnt and had had a lot of issues, and all the vegetation was dying. Then they did the reset. Once that Andronicus and his crew members knew that everything was okay, they had to start going to other outposts and collect some of their their people. And one of them was Sector Four Three Eight. So they go to Sector Four Three Eight. They see that that planet was also had. You know, quite a bit of destruction, but they end up getting their people free and, and take them along, and then they end up in the blue planet Saffron. And on the blue planet Saffron, they find <clears throat> these species. <clears throat> it was, one was the, the Ketrons, they called them at first, and then they turned the name change to the Ketritons. And you can see where this is going, so you've got Triton and Tron. Um, and of course, you know, Kronos comes up later, and we realize that Kronos is involved uh, from more of a distance. And then Prometheus also shows up at some point, uh, because uh, after they leave uh, the planet Zephron, they go on to their next um, outpost, which is they head- heading to. They call it. Um, it's really Saturn, but they're calling it Satar. And. Uh, so all all of these you know the stuff unfolds, but so the, the the primary characters that show up on Zephron are really the players that we've seen so far is is the Titans, um, and then the Mars plant uh, beings, which they call the Lucido, and I don't know why he calls them Lucido, and I think there's another species on the Mars they called the Vonita, and uh, there might even been a third species there. But the Lucido particularly are like scientists, and they're always mixing and, and making stuff. And um, they also can step into black holes, which is none of the other species seem to be able to do that. But they're smaller in size. They're they're maybe either more dense in size, or um, uh, maybe about three to four feet, I would say. Whereas you know the the Titans are are really large. They're more giant, and I think they were even scaled down. 
so that they can interact with the Andromedans, who the Andromedans might be a taller version of us. And so you have, you know, the tri- the Titans, the uh, which is the Ketrons, uh, the Andromedans, the Mars beings, which are the Lucido, are there, and then the um, uh, the Sleetaran, which are the lizard beings, and then there there are the Aldebrons, the beings from Aldebron, and they are females. And those yes. were the queens that we talked about. The Aldebron all, queens. Tell yeah. us about them. Well, they show up at some point where, uh, well, it's, it starts off, but we'll get back to you now that, that we're, get, we're going to set the stage now. So the Vincala come to Zephron, the blue planet Zephron. They go there, and then um, the Vegas are there. The Vegas are sort of the overseers there, Shiva and some of the others. There, there are some others there, and one of them is Gupta, right? That um, sort of like a, a teacher to the Andromedans. It's kind of they're benevolent. Whenever all the species are around, they kind of keep order of everything. It's almost like they're they're not partial toward any, but if one of them is not doing what they're supposed to do, then they kind of remind them that their time is up and they have to leave. And so um, the the Vegas asked the uh, Vincala to leave because they weren't behaving. And they kind of, uh, the, the Andromedans sort of kind of take uh, control of Zephron, not by force, but because they're similar to the Vegas in a sense that they're sensible and they're, they're overseeing everything. And as they're, they're overseeing everything, um, they, they are curious about what happened to the Vincala. I mean, they're a little fascinated by them. They were dominated by them for so long that they kind of want to keep an eye on them. They don't trust them. So they go over to their camp and they come up to this space where they hear a woman, a woman's voice. Now, um, the Andromedans don't have their females there, or at least, you know, those, their mates. They, they don't have anyone there with them at that time. And so, you know, they're hearing a female voice. They're curious of what's going on. And, and so they, uh, go over and they see this hole and they go down this winding spa- uh, staircase and go in and they see this woman who's tied up. Looks like she has been abused and, um, claims that she is a queen from, uh, Sumer. And so, um, somehow the word, it's almost like the French word, um, ami or amis. Um, A-M-I um, so he calls her Sumer Amis and uh, and then I started thinking I'm saying well that name sounds familiar and it was uh, Semiramis I realized that he was talking about Semiramis and he said that she was a queen and that she went in and then she came back out again and uh, uh, so so she was she was in the other dimensional space well he what they did was they rescued her and they pulled her up but what they didn't realize is when they were rescuing her, they were actually pulling her out of the timeline. So then, at some point, they bring her back. They, they, every, all the species on the planet said that you threw off the whole timeline and it interfered and, and caused an imbalance. So he was asked to return, uh, Sumer back into the portal because apparently it was a portal. He thought she was just in the earth. He didn't realize he was pulling her out of a portal in a timeline. So what it seemed to do, uh, Jess, they seemed to discover uh, basically like a Stargate room, and they Mm -hmm. could see her on the other side. Now, here's the thing. How was it that she was appearing in uh, in this Stargate? How did that happen? You know, because that, that, does that always, you know, that doesn't normally happen, does it? No, the Vincala put her there. The Vincala had captured her, but they were going into, but it, probably her and many others that they were taking in and out of the timelines. And that could explain why some of these people were referred to as deities because they would leave and then return. And I also believe she was the same as Ishtar. It was the same thing. Um, and the story of Ishtar is that she was brought um, she went into another, like in, in the underworld, and then she died, and then she came back to life again. And that's sort of what happened with, uh, Sumer. They, uh, they brought her in. It looked like, might have looked like she died, and then here she reappears in, in, you know, 
like almost like she had um uh you know came back to life and i believe that's happened um some even speculate that happened with christ and excuse me if anyone is offended by that but it's just another theory that jesus maybe didn't die he stepped into a timeline and just came back and um or some variation of that so uh you know that there are with with the um reptilians and what i'm seeing is that they they were jumping into the timelines and all trying to alter certain things and particularly by taking humans out and then putting them back in in maybe wrong places or um uh making them appear as deities which you know they're essentially humans so um, so something is something goes on when you uh have time traveled mm-hmm. you develop a, a a level of consciousness that is <clears throat> well i think you know it's it changes your dimension uh i remember william stillings a real time traveler uh saying right. that going through the jump room uh which is the gateway to mars was a a um now what was the word he used calibrating experience mm. which is an interesting thing to say but it's like sure. i imagine that what he's meaning by that is that it puts things into perspective and leaves your stuff behind you know that which is you gets teleported and that which isn't you is no longer there you know mm-hmm. when you use a teleport machine it kind of cleanses you of the bugs that's an interesting mm. concept but uh, what happens if there's so much bug on the other end right. <laughs> that, that, that that's that, that stuff still remains you probably have to shoot it uh <laughs> <laughs> well, like that other movie, right? You find yourself and yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. or Loopers, and there's the other one which was uh, yeah. the Prestige, mm-hmm. where Tesla, played by David Bowie, um, developed a teleport which replicated himself. So he had to kill, <laughs> he had to actually kill a version of himself and then appear Ta-da! on the other side. That's the Prestige. Yeah. Ta-da! Anywho, so time travel and. Uh, and Semiramis and dimensional travel that the idea that she was to um, she would disappear at one point and everybody thought she was dead or or something and then she appeared somewhere else and her legend continued and that became a mystery and the mystery can easily be kind of explained by the use of time travel eh? Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and I and I had no idea where this was going and when he called her Sumer it was because she referred to the land or like the Sumerians you know and this this was where I'm from which he thought that was her name and you know how that always gets confused but there is this relationship that develops between them which is something that wasn't intended to happen either because she was of a different species and um, there was a, a, a romantic interlude that that occurs and then soon after um, they're asking her to leave and now he has this emotion that he didn't know existed and the fact that he is absent of her and he longs for her um, there was a connection in, in between and so um, you're seeing that as as time goes on and as these transmissions come through that he's having emotions and then he starts to develop this kind of philosophical view of of his life and space and everything else around him it's like we're getting to watch him evolve it's and, absolutely and, and we're seeing him evolve but without the suppression of emotions but by the experience of going through emotions that at some time feel like they're going to destroy him you know, mm-hmm. we get all the drama of that, and we get this very calm voice describing these these possibly terrifying or traumatic situations that he's going through. Um, and uh, it's uh, it, and he learns how to make hard decisions. You know, it's the it's the as I said, it's just like a TV series. Um, and so, one of the reasons that uh, they wanted Sumeramis to leave was 
you know they all felt the disturbance in the force of the whole thing and and this is the key to the transmission is is that there's like this trans dimensional relationship going on that you know like doctor who and his uh, and his uh, tardis works across time and space anyway we'll be back at the on the other side of the top of this hour with some fascinating stuff and maybe we'll uh, accept that phone call who's been taking who's been calling all the way through don't go away don't go away fascinating yes indeed it is fascinating and uh, rather than Vulcan uh, we'll be dealing with the Vulcans next actually probably on um, on uh, Muggsy's show on Wall Street Radio um, the, we, we had them you know I had uh, Ray Kusalandich last night uh, who's quite uh, he's apparently a third generation contactee and he's been contacting like 34 races um, wow. and uh, you know you know, there's a lot of cross pollination so it might be interesting to run this one by him because there's a <laughs> lot of um, you know a lot of people's stories everybody's got their own universe and these universes are intersecting right mm-hmm. now almost every, every universe is intersecting with every other and we're beginning to see uh, what people mean by parallel or maybe not parallel how about angular dimensions you know mm-hmm. instead of it being a, a parallel space it's like it's just another five degrees away you know yes. like you turn a <laughs> dial on the on the radio that's it's, more like it <laughs> yeah so it's a vector it's a direction and then you know people talk about you know finding direction in life and things like that it always works that way so jess we're back uh, I'm back with uh, Jessica Morocco. Uh, this uh, is uh, Journeys with JP on Revolution Radio, the 115% listener-supported site, uh, as in we need your donations. Um, uh, I'm also part of Wolf Spirit Radio Wolf Pack, the Wolf Spirit Media Network, uh, which includes now wolfspirit.tv. Um, and uh, if you're a fan at all of Alex Collier and uh, you didn't manage to make it live to the uh, to the first two webinars, we're going to have another webinar on Friday at uh, 11 PST. Um, that's, what's that? Two, uh, that's 2 Eastern and uh, 7 PM UK time. So it's uh, quite accessible. Um, and that's where you can actually get to ask him a question because people send me... Qu- I have to say, please... Stop sending me questions for Alex. Stop sending me questions for Simon. The only time you get to the, uh, you get me to put a question to these guests is during the show. The rest of the time, I have to run a radio station, and uh, I have a life as well. So I don't spend my time talking to all these these ho- uh, these guests and and asking them questions on everybody's behalf. Please, I don't do that. Uh, it's impossible, you know. So. If you want to come along, come along to the webinar. It doesn't cost much, and it raises money for Alex. And uh, what you get is the opportunity to ask that question, because his time is precious, like yours is. So exchange some of that and, you know, find some higher wisdom reflected in his words. So that's on Friday. Come to alexcollier.org or wolfspiritradio.com. Uh, forward slash listen and uh, just click the Alex Collier banner and you see you'll you know it'll take you along the process. Um, as I said, it's very cheap. It's uh, you know uh, and it, it's a it's a benefit gig. It's for Alex. He's he's been living in a, a a Land Rover. Do you know what a Land Rover is? It's a little truck like a Isuzu, you know, trooper. Suzu, I don't know. Anyway, one of those. He's been living in one of those. He's had cancer. And everybody loves him, and you know nobody helps him. So we've decided, James Harkin, um, who is an angel on this planet, uh, and I have, have uh, arranged some gigs for him, benefit gigs. So come along, and you can ask questions there, and support him. We don't get a penny, James and I, not for these ones anyway. We're going to do some more. We're going to do some paid gigs, um, and uh, you know it'll be a, a slightly more deep uh interaction that you have with the uh with the host and, and and with the guest so 
to the end. Here we are, back in Andromeda. <laughs> oh, cool! I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do want to add that that Alex Collier is, is a fellow Andromedan who's, you know, it's just another extension of that suffering that they went through. And uh, I would highly recommend anyone that's a follower of Andronicus to support Alex and help him through that. It's it's a difficult thing he's going through right now. Absolutely. So you know we haven't. I don't know. He might come in at some point in the in the in the history of this thing. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I don't. I, I'm not even sure if we're that far back with it. You know, if if or you know. Oh. He might be from like yeah. you know we we try to figure it yeah. out and I haven't come across and I've kind of like hinted to Andronicus and mm. said oh what is Alex Collier coming and I almost felt like he was at um, on an he was with another group on another journey another uh, group of Andromedans that were separate and maybe at some point that they intersect but yeah. it seems like they're journeyers you know yeah. they're, they're they're out there um, they're kind of. Uh, working for the universe, and part of that is is in this traveling um, state where they're they're going from these different outposts and uh, learning and kind of uh, intermingling with the other species. So I I kind of have gotten the feeling that Andronic, uh, the that Alex Collier was not exposed to Andronicus, but maybe he was. I mean, maybe I I haven't even talked to him about it, you know, and I don't think you have yet either. I don't know. Um, no, bec- well, one of the things is that I, what I wanted to do was to kind of gather the whole thing together in mm-hmm. a um, in a document. <laughs> when it, when, you know, I thought it was only going to be about five. You know, I thought it was going to be about five or six little little messages, so and then then I it would end, and you know. But now we're on <laughs> episode twenty, and it's looking like a mini series. It's looking longer than a mini series. It's looking like an entire season. And it's kind of yeah. writing itself as a chapter. You know, we could, we could probably give this to a screenwriter who would make a fantastic adventure. And this is the thing that um, Alex was talking about um, right away, you know, two years ago, three years ago, we were talking about him in some unpublished interviews um, because they were for a book that he's written. Um, and he said that if he ever wanted, you know, if he ever <laughs> had the idea of starting over again, that instead of going out and saying hello, I'm an Andromeda and contactee, and uh, wait for the shit to fly, um, what he would rather do is to actually um, uh, write a book that was a story, like a science fiction story, and that's what mm-hmm. he did. And it's called Captain Dinar, you know, the Adventures of Captain Dinar. And uh, we. You know, we recorded these a couple of years ago, and um, I was very inspired at the time. And I had I made a little theme tune, and uh, it's you know it's a cheesy little uh, science fiction theme tune. I don't even presume that he he's ever going to use it, but that's the tune that I've been using um, for the interviews that I've done with him, and for the oh, webinars. Okay. So the music that you hear at the beginning of this thing is is the the the, the theme tune for, for this this non non-manifest um, uh, science fiction show which is The Adventures of Captain Denar now The Adventures of, of Andronicus is another is is a whole other series you know <laughs> that should should have its own theme tune then yeah so maybe <laughs> maybe we should you know well, maybe I, I should I think ch- it should be like very very like tone related you know what I mean yes very, very m- monastic yeah oh maybe maybe not but yeah, there's definitely have this kind of out of space kind of thing. Yeah, it could be <laughs> sort of maybe a little bit lighter, you know, and maybe more s- spacey sounding. You know, yeah, uh, kind of uh, more like more like this. Hang on, uh, let's see if I can. Uh, one of these. Some of that, maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe a little bit of that. That's uh, Star Trek Voyager, <laughs> which yeah. uh, which has uh, Catherine Janeway uh, as uh-huh. a uh, as a female captain um, of a of a Federation starship that gets flung into a, a well, basically it gets thrown through a black hole uh, across the other side of the galaxy 
far, far, far away. Far yeah. further than warp drive. You know, warp drive appears only to be able to take you across, you know, a different sector of a galaxy. Yeah, so, it sounds like you're in, help, helped by the uh, the Mars beings. Mm. The so here's the thing. Mosquito. The Andromedans mm-hmm. are, and it's something that he said, uh, they're very up on measurements. And every time he's given us a communication, there's been this code number uh, that comes with right. them. Uh, you know, and I think maybe we should have that at the top of each chapter because that's like Captain's Log, Star Date twenty five seventy four thirty six. You know, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, th- th- this could work. We we we'll think about it. I'll, I'll think about it. I, th- I think at one time you, you, I think in the beginning you were looking at those numbers and you looked it up on on uh, Google Space, and it actually came to a location. This is kind of the bizarre stuff that was happening as. The transmissions would unfold, then we would have these like really weird moments where we would say, "All right, now, so that came up at you know this is the location in space where it came up at, and actually he says, "You said Tolek said that that's where the Andromedans were, and you said, "You know Tolek, and I said, "No, I never heard of Tolek and so so but it was just like one of those weird moments where we were seeing some agreement on what something someone else had said before about um, you know the Andromedans and now um, more recently we had a woman contact us um, I don't know if we should say her name or not should we have permission uh, and their name is Lisa I'll say it like that uh, and she contacted us recently because we were talking about the Titans and then I mentioned Zeus and she asked if we had known this gentleman um, who talked about being an incarnated Titan um, and, and I thought I didn't know who he was I didn't know who he well I'd, I'd heard this guy's name but in a completely different context mm-hmm. so uh, she put go the ahead. dots together and yeah she, she said well you said this and he said this and now neither one of us had communicated I didn't know anything about what he had talked about, but apparently we're having these these little like, you know, oh, really? <laughs> That's interesting, you know, that someone else is already is saying the same thing, but we had never talked to communicated to them. So it, you know, it's kind of for me, it feels like a nice little validation and encouraging me that some of these, you know, these things, um, from my perspective, did in fact happen. But um, you know, of course, is that's my perspective you know there's no fact and there's no ability to prove it but it does seem kind of odd that we're seeing this this coinciding uh, pieces of information that that kind of validate what we're talking about and we're like wow this just sounds like some you know science fiction story and yet others are are saying the same thing so yeah it's uh, a bit like one of these sorry it's a bit like one of these three-dimensional puzzles that you have to, you can only solve if you think fourth dimensionally. You know, you have mm-hmm. to keep looking from a higher perspective on the unfolding of these things and how they, they are all the truth. They're all aspects. They're all fragmented aspects of the truth. And what we're experiencing is the uh, reintegration of those fragments. And as we heal each other, we, mm-hmm. reintegr- we reintegrate fragments of ourselves, things, that, uh, parts that were shattered during trauma, and we bring them together and we got, become healed. And that heals the whole of us as well. And there's part of the story is unfolding is that these people we, we call gods or titans or um, the idea of... Prome- uh, we saw the film in Prometheus where the guy uh, drinks the juice and dissolves into the rivers so that then he uh, seeds the planet. So his DNA mm-hmm. then um, connecting with the matrix of the planet produces the race of, of uh, whatever becomes uh, the human race or whatever. The, the, you know. So uh, the human race is known as the children of Prometheus. Prometheus. But uh, the idea that that is the journey of the source is you know, the journey of the fool through the tarot deck like we were talking about in the last show. That Prime, is it? Now, he came in as 
uh, Teos Primus Prime. Teos. Uh, as Teos Prime or Primo oh. Teos. Right? Primus Teos. Primus yeah. Teos, which means first creator. Yeah? Mm. You know? If, you know, they, they talk about De- a Deus, a Teos, you know? Um, yeah. And, so uh, then it was Primus Teos, which evolved into Prometheus. Yes. Yeah, and what's we- really weird is I'm seeing, like, the, the earlier name, and then I said, oh, that sounds like, and that, that's what it was. You know, it was like Sumer Amis, Sumer Amis, which was Semiramis, is, is the later writing about it. Same with, uh, pr- uh, Primus Teos, which was Prometheus, you know, that it evolved into that. And, uh, Ketriton, K- uh, Ketron, which turned out to be Tron later on, and Ketriton, which was Triton. And, um, there was a, there was another one too. That so, had its hang on evolution. a second, because Tron is now Metatron. Is that right? It's also Metatron. It's also yes. Metatron. So, you know, it's like... You asked me and then I asked him and he verified uh-huh. this. Uh, yes. And so this is, this is the thing. It's like we hear these names and a lot of them, it's like, um, they're almost like uh, a prime, uh, like prime minister or something like that or president. It's a, it's an office or a state of beingness like master or something like that. Um, again, uh, we use words that confuse us with personalities. And so it may be possible that maybe many, many beings are called Primus Deus or Prime Creator or um, representative of the, of the source number one on this pla- in this place, on this plane. You know, it's like a, it's, it's not the name of someone, it's a position of something. Of someone. Well, the, the primus, the primus seemed to be the name of that they had. Now that the Ketrons or the Ketritons, because they become the Ketritons after a battle between Ketron and Ketriton, they their brothers, and uh, Ketriton actually cut off the arm of Ketron at one point, um, but their arms grow back, apparently, but they're just like very, very like aggressive. Um, very, you know, just as, as the story of the tri- uh, Titans were, you know, just very physical. And, um, and also, you know, they're, they're about, you know, who gains control. And so whoever gains control then takes the name over. So at some point there'll be a, a Titan, you know, so the, the name Titan somehow, uh, takes, uh, the, the higher level and then everyone takes on the name. So that's what their group becomes. Um, so, I mean, this, this is the way they were explaining it to me. So at some point, um, there, then there's this, this one that's very disruptive and, uh, his, his name is Borkum, but they end up calling, Andronicus really doesn't like him because he's very obnoxious and very loud. And so they call him Barkum. He calls him Barkum. Because he's barking around and he's, yes. I can imagine, is it like a kind of rhinoceros type fellow? <laughs> yeah, just just constantly, you know, saying things loud and boisterous. And so, so what I'm starting to see is there's this levels of um, command. So Barkham is like of the lower command, but the ones with the K E or the 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 you know the Ket Ketron Ket Triton Ket, you know K E sounding before the name. Um, there's also Kraton that shows up later, and. Um, these these are uh, the ones that are sort of like siblings of um, I don't know if there are siblings and related to Kronos, who is then like their their overseer their father, and then there is the uh, Prometheus, which is like a commander, and then there are other commanders. The commanders seem to have a higher ability. So at some point they all have to depart from the planet Zephron. Zephron ends up getting polluted and some problems which we think are the Mars beings that seem to have a trail of, you know, indiscretions that they do on each, uh, planet because they're like scientists and they're experimenting and then they alter the field and the, and the chemistry of the field. And, um, not deliberately, but I think they're sort of, um, kind of haphazard in, in a way. And, uh, they're I mean, like Werner you know, Eckert. They're Nazi scientists, basically. 
Yeah. They don't care. Yeah. They, they, they don't care about people or the heart. They're just mind people. That's their thing. Yeah. And then they go, go through black holes. They, and like I said, they're small, but they're kind of, don't underestimate them. You know, they, they're very smart and they, you know, they, they build cities. They, they use, uh, that, uh, the ability to, um, potentially they, they could have been the ones that, that created our pyramids. Um, or the anti-gravity, you know, they have a, 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 the ability to use anti-gravity and they can move things. So they don't need their physical strength, whereas the Tritons are, you know, the Titans are pretty strong, uh, physically and they're giants. Um, so at some point, um, before the planet Zephron gets destroyed, we, we talked about this earlier about the queen, which was Sumer, Sumer, uh, Amis being there. And then she having to leave, and then at some point there's the visitors from Aldebaran and the, the, their queens. And uh, she, the, the, I said, "What's the name of the head queen?" And they said, Sh- "Sharia." And I said, "Sharia," and it was uh, like S H E at S H E hyphen R E E hyphen Y A Sharia, something like that. So I tried to, you know, phonetically put it together, and uh, she was very demanding. She wanted to be worshipped. She saw herself as a queen. Um, you know, it was very much like the uh, the uh, priestesses of Dune. Oh, well, the um, Bene Gesserit. Bene Gesserit. So that that's a yeah. char- that's their character. They're very controlling. Yeah. And they again use that that voice. They used sonic control, right. didn't they? They did, and and so the, there's that that attitude. And the Mars beings were very subservient to them, as well. And then they started to bring in though the uh, Slitaran to assist them. And they were building city, uh, like a city or buildings for the um, Aldebarans. And and uh, Andronicus doesn't understand what's going on. He knows that there's some activity going on. And at the same time, they they make sure he gets rid of his girlfriend. Um, Sumer, and then, uh, then now the Aldebarans come in and they're saying, essentially, we're taking over, and it's these priestesses, uh, uh, like the Bene Gesserit, and, uh, so the, the Ketrons, they don't like it, the Titans, they don't like it, right? And as well as the Andromedans don't like it, but the Slitaran and, and the Mars beings of, um, uh, Lucido, they, they kind of are subservient and helping them already. They're already under their control. And uh, so the the Ketrons and the Dromedans, you know, disagree with them, and then they end up leaving. The Aldebarans leave, but then they see that there's a problem on the planet, and so they all have to get on a craft. Now the the Aldebarans actually take um, the Titan craft from them, and uh, so that the although it seems like it might have might have had a higher design, you know, where the 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 Titans end up having to spend time. With the Andromedans, and they have to be on their ship. And, and they that have two ships. that moment is very reminiscent of the time when, in Star Trek, they first kind of came on board with the with the Klingons. Yeah. And the character of the Vinka of of the of the Katritons is kind of like the, the the Klingons. They're like bikers, aren't they? They're like you know, it's like. Argh! Yeah. Yeah. You know, all this all the time. But they don't want to go into hypersleep. That's right. They all don't they trust want to anyone. Do is they're, they're battle games on sh- on the ship, and they start getting get into it with the Andromedans, and start to pull some of the Andromedans into their war games. You know, it's almost like you know that's what they do. That's how they hone their skills. It's it's like you know they're sparring. They're doing all this stuff, and Andro- and Andronicus is out of his mind. He's yeah. like, <laughs> like, wait a minute. We're yeah. trying to run a ship here. What is going on? And, you know, this is a, supposed to be a controlled space. And you've got all sorts of, you know, probably physical, you know, bantering and, and, and fighting. And, uh, but all in, you know, their own, like you said, that kind of bar scenario where there's this aggression <laughs> happening and they're kind of going at it. And, uh, so Andromeda, Andronicus is just like a little overwhelmed and he's looking at them and, you know, he's not sleeping. He's right on at his wit's head end, and he's about to lose it. And uh, somewhere out of nowhere uh, arrives um, Primus Teos. 
And, and, and he, this guy just steps into the room. Right, and so he's upset. He's, and he's not happy. Like, Wait a minute! You you broke you broke our uh, security. How did you get on the ship? Um, who are you to come in here and try to take command of my ship like this? So he's you know immediately on edge, and Primus Tanis you know tries to explain to him and has a discussion, and gets everything in order, um, and also removes um, a few of them, including Barkham, from the ship, sends them. You know, somehow transports them off the ship. It kind of it, the, there's the feeling of of he kind of drags them by the scruff of the neck. You know, oh yeah, yeah, get out of there. You know, and, you know, just sort. <laughs> he just comes in and sorts the whole place out. Right. And these guys scatter, mm-hmm. don't they? I mean, you know, they respect him. They yeah, respect. They're, they're scared the of him. <laughs> the command is is Prometheus. Is they have to listen. And uh, even though they begrudgingly do, and I know that Barkham does not really care for any authority, and so that that really makes it hard on him. Um, and he's immediately, you know, considered to be uh, removed, um, sent back to maybe a training field where he has to do some hard labor or something. Um, but the others are, uh, you know, kind of in agreement. And what he does is he can he tells them that they all need to go into hypersleep. And they didn't want to, um, but they do that. And so Andro- Andronicus um, is finally gets some rest. Um, the only two that stay awake are Ketron and Ketriton, which are brothers. And then that's where they have their battle over who's going to be in charge of 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 their tribe. And, that, and that's just so typical of reptilians, you know. They wait till everybody else is asleep. And then they hatch out a plot between them, or right. or they battle out between them. You know, all right, we're the only two left now. Okay, so it's either you or me. Okay, we're gonna. Be, we're, one of us has to be the leader, right? Right. Oh, so we got a battle to the death, right? Right. Okay. Uh, so who should we start? You know, and it's it's that kind of. Sch- I, and I can, you know, it's a real face palm because imagine you got these two kind of arguing Klingon brothers on the deck of the Enterprise and there's there's Picard just sitting in his chair staring at this whole thing with his face in his hand. Yes, like what's what's going on? But not only that, Andronicus gets shocked because he sees, you know, the, the, he sees uh, Ketriton cutting off the arm of Ketron. He's just like, oh, I'm like, I've had enough of this and he just cuts off his arm and he's like horrified, like, what did you just do? That's your brother, you know? I mean, he just, it, it's beyond him. He, cause he, you know, here you have this simple, very loving, kind, hey, you know, let's sit around the circle, let's share our food, let's give to one another. And then you have this brutish behavior, it didn't make any sense to him. And, you know, he was just beside himself. He just didn't know how to understand it. And they didn't trust him, and he didn't trust them. And, um, towards the end, they start to understand. He also realizes that they can grow their limbs back. So that's not a big deal. Um, but it's sort of their rites of passage to do these things and culturally understand. And he's learning not to be judgmental of it entirely, but at the same time, he's kind of appalled by different things here and there, you know. That's fascinating as well. Uh, when we, uh, especially when you talk about uh, this, this guy called himself Captain K. Have you heard of this guy? He, no. you know, spends 17 years on Mars being part of the Mars Defense Force battling against uh, reptilians and mantoids in the North Pole of Mars guarding a gated community that houses billionaires. Um, well, that all came out in one go. That was quite good. See, see what the name is, Captain K, like the, the Ketrons? <laughs> well, he's, a rep- he's got a reptilian, he's, got, he's a hybrid. You know, right. He's a hybrid no, no. super soldier. Oh. And um, he's he says he's that he's been blown up, you know, many many times, almost almost to the point of being like there's just the kind of spark of him left, and they managed to kind of rebuild him and revive him using the these uh, uh, advanced technologies that they have, which basically just like the Catronians, um, take a, take a person who's injured and, and make them whole again. Yeah, amazing, eh? Yeah, it is. So, 
so there we go so we got we got these two brothers and um and so the one who loses the arm basically is the uh you know because he can't do the command thing with his index finger anymore so uh the other one wins and is therefore the director right yeah is that the way it works Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, become, becomes the the head of the group now, and they have to listen to him. And his name is Ketriton. Ketriton. So now we have Ketriton, and um, he takes things in a different direction, or his way. What what is Ketriton's way? Uh, well, interesting enough, the next. They're supposed to be headed toward Satar, which is Saturn, but Andronicus pronounces as Satar. And uh, they end up, I don't know if we've introduced this yet, but they end up in Neptune. All right, no, I haven't been to Neptune yet. So that this is coming right. up in, in the future episodes. Right, and who, who's in command? Triton. Triton. So, Triton... On Neptune. That's how he got there. Yep, that's how he got there. Okay, so we have Triton, we have the the, the Triton, uh, the uh, Trident, um, yeah. and uh, the Trihards and <laughs> Blowhards. So we've got uh, we've got the beginning of our mythical history that is actually okay. occurring outside of our planet. So when we may look for Mount Olympus, we may be actually talking a metaphor. Or that they had, you know, they got other homes, you know, like or Dick we, Cheney's. Or we were one of their outposts. Yeah, yeah that, that too. Yeah. yeah. Interesting that Captain K has yeah. a K. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. It may be that the K is, is part of the reptilian language that is like, like I was saying on Babylon 5, um, the characters are called Jakar, Jaquan, Katwan, you know, they've, they've all got this in front, you know, like in, in Zulu, they have the sound and, um, uh, and different, different things that are pronounced on, on, you know, i it would be, uh, very interesting to hear what, uh, you know, mantids sound like and things like that if you, if they actually spoke, you know, non telepathically. But, uh, the, so the, there's this sound of uh, Kurt at the beginning of the reptilians' names, and mm -hmm. uh, then we have well, particularly the Tritons or the Titans. Yes, the the, the Titans and the Tritons and the you um, know, and uh, you know, it's a bit. I, you know, to me, it's just a bit like it's like a title, you know, Mister, you know, or Ms. Like Ms. Morocco, sure. you know, um, mm -hmm. or Mister Spock, you know, he's known as Mister Spock. His name is Spock, but. Um, but uh, Captain Kirk calls him Mr. Spock because... Bit of a prefix. Yeah, as he yeah. always gives people... You know, the captain always calls people Mr. You know, mm -hmm. if they have no title, they're Mr. You know, whatever. Because they're you know, somehow... The, what the heck are they doing on the bridge, Mr.? What are you doing on the bridge, Mr.? <laughs> and so you become Mr. Spock and Mr. You know. Anyhow, Mr. Sulu. Uh, so, meanwhile, back in Andronicus' world, um, he's... He's finally, uh, you know, he's finally got the brothers have got uh, have got peace. Um, Primus Teos has taken away the assholes and um, uh, put the rest in deep freeze, so they're all mm -hmm. out of the way. Um, is is Triton is Triton now happy and and able uh, to let Andronicus get a night's rest? Yeah, they, they, you know, they really look at Andronicus as um, non-threatening. They, they could have harmed him. They could have harmed all of the Andromedans. But the Andromedans are, you know, the ones that are supplying food. They're the farmers. You know, they're, they're caring for the atmospheric stuff. Here, they're carrying them in, in the ship. So there's, there's somewhat of a, you know, a, a, a gratitude that begins to develop and that the Andromedans are at first, you know, um, Andronicus is very, very upset when he meets the Ketrons. 
in Ketron in particular because Ketron puts on this really loud uh, tone that is piercing to Andronic- Andronicus. He's very put off by him and uh, um, the Vegas and particularly Gupta have to pull him aside and say you need to not be angry and resentful toward them um, but because it, neither one of you get along uh, you're going to have to kind of work it through and so um, they get to, to understand and, and know a little bit about each other and so the hostility and the aggression, which it was kind of, you know, like a dog walking down a trail and another dog shows up and immediately, you know, the hair is on end and their their teeth are showing and there's a bark. Um, it was the same thing the Ketrons were doing that. You know, they're trying to intimidate the other species immediately so that they can get it under control right away. And uh, once Andr- Andronicus recognizes that, they, he realizes that there is some form of understanding that they develop and there are attributes about each other that they do seem to like and so it was meaningful for the the crews to kind of get together and take this trip so there's a form of gratitude that takes place um but there is something that is noticeable to me that Andronicus doesn't you know he's kind of so accustomed to seeing it that that it was not obvious to him and that was a black stone that I noticed on the back of their necks, uh, kind of um, behind, the, uh, you know, above the shoulder and beneath the, the the head, you know, the vertebrae in that area, was this black stone that was protruding and almost looked like it was connected directly to the vertebrae and almost sort of like a horn-looking piece, but it was pure black and... I was wondering what that stone was, and all of the um, the Titans had them. And I said, "Well, what what is that stone?" And I said, Don't, "That did not look unusual to you." And he said, "He said with all the unusual things about them compared to us, that was something that would least bothered us." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to, it's like you you wanted to notice something weird about them. They're already weird. <laughs> They're yeah, already beyond our saying. experience. Yeah, uh, you yeah. can really understand that. So, but you brought it to his attention, and uh-huh. and of course, you know, we've been talking about the black stones of of Shungai, but there's like that's the good black stone, but there are bad there are bad black stones which are also quantum entangled which are probably, you know, I believe this stuff comes out of stars. I believe this black carbon material comes out of stars uh, as, as, um, it's like a carbon arc product Um, because a star is an enormous carbon arc. Uh, Anyway, long story. Um, It's an electrode. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not a bomb. It's an electrode. And it, it, it translates energy from the higher dimensions down into the, into the lower dimensions. That's why it's cold out in space and only warm on the surface of the planet. Anyhow. Yeah, so, um. Yeah, go on. He, he sees, the, you know, he looks at the stone and so, um, he doesn't get back to me until, uh, you know, the next transmission. He starts telling me the story. It was like he, started thinking about it and uh, and he said that um, he asked Ketron I believe it was Ketron about the black stone and uh, Ketron took it out and out of his neck and then handed it to him and went to hand it to him and he said uh, he said no 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 he goes because he put it in, in uh, Andronicus's hand, and Andronicus was ready to put it on the back of his neck to see what it was like. And so Ketron said, you can't do that, you're not one of us. And so immediately, you know, there was this feeling like, well, what exactly is this? And um, Ketron is then gone, and he picks up the stone, and he's examining it, and he realizes that um, the other properties, it was much more potent before, but uh, some of the properties, maybe it was a programming or what um, held, had him connected in to this um, type of uh, command because technically everyone that was under them um, had this stone in them and it was a way that they kind of were able to communicate and it was a way that they were able to keep 
them um, in the military mindset of what their mission was instead of going off kind of and what they found out later is that Barkham had lost his stone that's why he was out of out of order he was just acting rambunctious and and they couldn't calm him down and, and so they sent him back and they had to reinsert the stone and uh, <clears throat> so then he, I start to see this um, other titan named Craton and Craton is, uh, he ended up on, uh, you know, as a journey, he, he went to this planet where all this black stone existed. And he picked it up. And the, the, the stone had this um, ability to, to carry information and also, I won't say it was programmable. Not, you know, I mean, they talk about the programmable, programmable matter. Um, you know, that's something that's man-made, but we're talking about something that, you know, maybe had, uh, you know, everything's living, so in some way this stone had a form of intelligence. Oh, yeah. We know that Shungai has a, a consciousness that uh, you can right. communicate with and you can uh, ask it to do things. And mm -hmm. in that way, that's what, you know, that's what I mean by programming something. Um, you can ask it to, you know, they're very happy to cooperate with you. You don't have to force them. So in that way, it's and a programming. Yeah. yeah, that's the positive black stone. Yeah, so and this is this is a positive black stone. So, and and it's coming very close to like the black oil in uh, Twin Peaks, the black goo in um, uh, the, what's the other one? The X Files, and Harold Calzavella's uh, black goo and the black goo that is the uh, the reason for the Falklands War. And the, bla the black stone of the Nazis, known as the Schwarzer Stein, otherwise is known as the Brotherhood of the Black Stone or the SS. Uh, so basically, this this all comes back to. Hang on, hang on. All comes back to. No, wrong one. This one. <laughs> oh, sorry. I should. I always get these things wrong. Anyway, it all comes back to. Aldebaran. It does. All right, so let, let's let's take this back now. We didn't. You mentioned all the different places where the black stone exists, but you didn't talk about the Dome of the Rock. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. Black. This is another black stone that people have to kiss once in their life. So, uh, right. If you're talking about a nanotechnology that has to come into contact with your skin to kind of infect you. Or program you, or multiply in your body to create some form of weird sort of DNA whizzling um, control pattern, uh, hive mind, collective consciousness thing. Um, please go ahead. Yeah. So this this Titan by the name of Kraton went to this planet, and because this this intelligent stone would take on the attribute of whatever. The, the, the person that, that connected with it had whatever the consciousness was at that time. And Craton was in a mindset of warfare. So he takes the stone with him and immediately it programs the stone to be in the mindset of violence and warfare and then brings it back with him to the other titans. And then as a commander, kind of like Primus so he might have been Primus Craton and had taken the stone and insisted that everyone wear them so and he gained control of the command and uh then you see that um later on you know um this this stone you know is like i said they they he's noticing that the stone exists and they all hold their rank they all do what they're supposed to do but the dome of the rock I was you know think about um, the the Titans, and one of their stones would be missing from the back of their neck. I mean, what size would it be for, if it was a giant? Could it be that exact size of that stone that's there? So, what could that be what, one of their head, one of the stones that were on the back of the neck of one of the Titans? Right. So, what you're proposing is that the device or the thing, the artifact, the object that is in the Dome of the Rock on on it, no, not it's not the Dome, it's the the Kaaba in Mecca. But that's what it is. Yeah. Is is Sorry. the big cube uh, 
and right at the corner of the cube is this kind of big sort of eye like sort of vagina like thing and right in the middle of that is is set this silver uh, mounting and in the silver mounting is this black stone and mm -hmm. every Muslim is supposed to to touch this to uh, kiss this now if for instance there is something about it that is like Shanghai it has a possible cleansing effect but it could have you know depending on the uh, mindset of the person who is uh, who, who that belongs to or the group that that belongs to so it then becomes a kind of psychic war as to who controls the black stone dan dan hang on a second program. Fascinating. the black stone who controls the black stone is to connected with the fourth right and right, the real so, society yeah. so keep going yeah and you're looking at that like i mean there's there's a few different theories now so all right so what if that was an original stone of the titans that was programmed for warfare still being dictated by kraton who ends up on saturn that could be the satan you know name that we got um uh, you know I, I was just trying to come up with all these different ideas and then also it was really fascinating to me. I have a friend of mine who was married to a man that was from Morocco. And uh, she was talking about the Sharia law. And I was like, wait a minute, where did I hear that name? I said, well, that was the name that they were calling the, the uh, priestess of Aldebaran that tried to take over the planet Zephron. And so does that mean that the, the Aldebarans were involved with this black stone, which then as you verified that the Nazis did use the black stone as well. So the Aldebaranians, you know, did come through and maybe they're the ones that have reprogrammed the stone. So there, there's just these different theories of, of, you know, uh, these off planet beings coming in and trying to influence our experience through, um, you know, uh, an off planet stone, you know, a space stone as you have it and and look how it's influenced that part of the world you know where what's their thought mindset is is a form of warfare which coincides with the titan uh experience is is everything's about war so that's it's a theory i mean obviously i couldn't prove it but it's something to consider and it adds um more to some of the origin about the you know the black stone and what what maybe where it possibly came from I don't know if it's a, one and the same with the black goo but it does seem to have a, a similar effect well what it seems to be is something to do with a particular formation of carbon which is what we call on earth shungite um, or buckyballs now I believe that buckyballs are the product of stars it's like the um, it, it it's like a uh, like the the build up like the crystal build up on something you mm -hmm. know and yeah. it occasionally gets ejected and then thrown into space and may land on a planet and it's a big chunk of the stuff and it's black and it's like the arc lamp uh, remnants you know imagine if you mm -hmm. had a massive arc lamp like they use in the cinemas or uh, or searchlights you know you eventually get this dust at the bottom of it because you have to keep you know it, it gets used up a lot of the carbon gets burnt away and boiled away as carbon dioxide but some of it you know ends up anyway so basically you end up with the uh, carbon product and uh, it gets ejected out of stars and lands on planets and has intelligence because it's part of a star and it's part of the cosmic stuff and it's programmable and so if you have a very powerful psychic person picking up lumps of this and sending them out with intent then just the same as what Nancy's been doing with by sending her, uh, sending things out with good intent, this guy sends these things out with manipulative intent, and that's what happens. Right, or whoever whoever is in charge of the programming of this black stone mm. is influencing all those that are involved or interacting with it, whether it's on this planet or off off world. Exactly, and so if you had an evil Nazi uh, organization underground in the world and you had a, uh, a, a device or material that could 
um, instantly communicate to everybody on a quantum level without having to use radio waves or any other form of you know communication that you just go remote control and everybody switches on. That would be handy for you if you had that sort of organization, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So we may have a clue as to how we may be able to disable this network. So perhaps if we can um, somehow neutralize the uh, the black stone that uh, that Katriton originally used to make war, yeah. and we can deprogram it. Kraton. That was yeah. Make sure it's Kraton because you don't want to get Triton involved in that. <laughs> All right, he's he's very sensitive about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Kraton. Yeah. Kraton. Okay. So, wow. I mean, this has been an amazing journey, Jessica. Um, we've uh, we've got a YouTube channel there, uh, Studio Nine Jam, and you can go there and. I've got a playlist. I'll pop the playlist in the uh, chat room here. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, that, um, which is, you know, you can listen to all the episodes. And it's great. It's like a science. Maybe it's like a, maybe we should do an audio version, like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You know, it was yeah. just originally a, a radio <laughs> show. So it's just me, me and Jessica, and I'm reading the voice of Andronicus. And then we talk about it a little bit, how it all kind of interacted with our lives. And uh, it's just incredible. So. Um, Jessica Morocco, please your uh, your website. How do people get hold of you? And uh, what else do you want them to know? How how can they hire you? You know, do you do, you do <laughs> private readings and stuff? Cause we, I do. I do uh, akashic record readings, and um, also I can talk to people about if they are they're having any type of uh, connection to uh, extraterrestrials or any paranormal activity. And uh, my website is www.readingsbyariel.com, and that's A-R-A-E-L.com. So readingsbyariel.com, and um, my email is Jessica at readingsbyariel.com. Um, so I can be reached, you know, if someone wants to schedule an appointment or have a discussion with me. I always love to talk to people about. You know, whatever their experience is, uh, they want to send me some information. And also, what's really kind of exciting is when people find a common thread to um, something that we're talking about in Andronicus, and then they, you know, have some questions or some experience regarding that, and feel free to contact me for that as well directly. And listen to the show. I mean, we also have these on YouTube. I just felt like that was something that we should do is kind of archive them and make them available to people to listen to um, that we probably should identify and highlight each each um, transmission so you kind of can filter through which ones you want to hear but listening to it um, you know right from the beginning to the end sometimes is the best way and, and you're going to get pieces of information in the after talk that maybe you can uh, listen to or pass over but uh, there's a lot of little you know a lot of good gems in there too that um, some of the topics that we discussed that might be helpful to you but uh, as far as I know it's going to continue going on and, and uh, also you know my book The Sea of Violets in the Grass um, talks a little bit about my background and uh, some of the type of work that I've done um, my experiences with the extraterrestrials um, and paranormal um, some of the psychic stuff and mediumship as well that I do so thank you so much, JP, for uh, letting me be a part of your show and, and also this uh, wonderful journey of uh, Andronicus and the being from Andromeda. So thank you. Indeed. So with that, 